Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back and good evening. Again, those of you that have completed the video interview assessment, well done. Those of you that have not, please make sure you do that uh, before 11.59 tonight. Okay, today we are dealing with topic number five and we're dealing with two, uh, two topics essentially. We have materiality and we have audit evidence. Now, the first thing I wanna quickly mention is materiality, ladies and gentlemen, it's a measure of importance or a measure of significance when it comes to the misstatements in the financial report. So material, remember, what we're trying to detect are material misstatements. So what is material will come down to this concept of materiality. What is material? Something that is uh, important, something that is significant, that's what material means. So we're gonna delve into that concept a little bit today. We're also going to discuss audit evidence. So I'm going to take you through the different types of audit evidence as well as the different types of audit procedures. Ladies and gentlemen, both of these topics, incredibly important. Incredibly important. So I'm going to start showing you the links between these concepts and what we discussed two weeks ago, which was assertions as well. So you really need to start seeing how all of these concepts are coming together. So let's begin. We'll deal with uh, materiality is first. Okay, first of all, materiality, ladies and gentlemen, is addressed in ASA 320. That is the auditing standard that deals with materiality. And remember what I just said, materiality is a measure of importance or significance when it comes to misstatements in the financial report. So when we find misstatements, we want to determine whether those misstatements are indeed material. Okay, and we use this standard to essentially help us with that. Now, materiality is so important because we actually consider it throughout the entire audit process. And I'm going to, I'm going to identify two particular stages where we use materiality very soon. Now, remember, the responsibility of the auditor is to detect material misstatements. I keep on mentioning MM, material misstatements. We're looking for not only misstatements, but those that are material. Those that, well, here we go, what does material mean? Those that will actually impact or influence a user's decision. That's what material means. It means that it's significant enough or important enough that it will impact on their decisions. So that's the context I'm providing you right now. So we actually assess, uh, sorry, we um, need to consider materiality throughout the entire audit process. In particular, we consider it when it comes to setting down the audit procedures that we're going to do, the amount of testing that we're going to do, and how much detail we're going to go into. All right, so it's really, really, really important. And it does mention it in these uh, components here. Now, the definition of materiality goes on to reflect what I just mentioned earlier. Information is material if it could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decisions of users. What does that mean? It's going to change their decisions. Information is material when it has the capacity of actually changing a user's decision based on that information. Now, remember... The context we are talking about is material misstatements. Remember, a misstatement is an error or it's a fraud, right? Intentional, a fraud or unintentional error. Now, what do, I, what do I want to emphasize here? One more thing. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most common misconceptions that there is about material misstatement is that it has to be when the information is wrong. Not necessarily, guys. There's one extra element I want everyone to be very mindful of. Omission is a misstatement as well. What's omission? Omission is if the accounting standards said that the business had to include a particular piece of information and the business didn't include that in the financial report, so it's missing, that's also a misstatement. Okay, so an omission of information, which is when it's not included, that's a misstatement just like information that is included but is stated at the wrong number or the wrong description. So please be mindful, omission is also a type of misstatement. And again, it can be material if the information that's missing could have impacted on a user's decision. All right, so please be mindful of that. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that we have spoken about this before, a misstatement can be material, guys, based on its amount. So it could be deemed to be significant because it's a big dollar amount, but it can also be deemed significant because of its nature, right? It might not be necessarily the dollar amount of the misstatement, but the nature of the misstatement itself. Ladies and gentlemen, best example, fraud. 
If you go back to two weeks ago, I provided you with an example of my friend who's a golfer. And his friend worked in the golf store where they sold the equipment. And he was fired because the management thought he stole $20. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't the $20 that was the issue. It was the fact that it was theft, right? In that situation, the issue wasn't the amount of the misstatement. It was the nature. By the way, theft is called misappropriation of assets. It's a type of fraud. Please be mindful of that. Fraud, there's two types. Fraudulent financial reporting, which is manipulation of the numbers, but also misappropriation of assets, which is theft. So in that case, he was being, or he was being accused of fraud, which is theft. And again, it wasn't the amount, it wasn't the $20 that they thought he stole, it was the nature of the act that made it significant. Please be mindful of that. Okay, so when we go through this process, uh, we look at both the amount of the misstatement but also its nature to determine whether it is indeed material. Now, I mentioned earlier that we uh, consider materiality throughout the entire audit process. Now, I'm just going to highlight two particular stages where that is indeed the case. Ladies and gentlemen, at the very beginning of the audit, we actually set what's called a materiality threshold. It's called planning materiality, but I'm going to start referring to it as the materiality threshold. Please write this down. Now, what is the materiality threshold? Ladies and gentlemen, what happens at the beginning of the audit is that we actually set a certain numerical level, a numerical threshold. It's a number. And what we do is we use that threshold as a reference point. We use that threshold to determine is this misstatement material or is it not material? Now, how does it work? The way that we determine this number is we pick a certain base, a base account. So that base account could be, for example, sales revenue. And we multiply that with a particular percentage. The result of this calculation is our materiality threshold. It's what I'm referring to down here. Now that number, so let me just give you an example so you can provide a bit more context. So say that we're using the base of sales revenue and the sales revenue is $10,000. We then apply a percentage. So say we apply a percentage of 20%. Okay, what's $10,000 times 20%? You can do it, I believe in you. What is it? What is it? $2,000, that took way too long, okay. No judgment, no judgment. You all have phones which have calculators in them, just saying, okay. <laughs> now the $2,000, ladies and gentlemen, that becomes your materiality threshold. That's your reference point. Now look over here, that's your reference point. So what that means is if you then identify or detect a misstatement, you compare it to this reference point. If the misstatement amount is higher than $2,000, the misstatement is deemed to be material. If it's below $2,000, the misstatement is deemed to be not material. So that's what I mean when I say it becomes your reference point. You use that to determine if the misstatement that you found, whether it is indeed material or not. Why is that important? Ladies and gentlemen, a material misstatement impacts on your audit opinion. If you go back to, I think it was our second lecture, where we started talking about the different types of audit reports, we had an unmodified report and a modified report. The modified report said that we think the, the, sorry, the, um, the financial report is materially misstated. How do we get to that conclusion? We used a threshold to determine whether the misstatements were material. Now, what happens if we find a material misstatement? We will talk about this later, but I'll just touch on it quickly. If we find it, we tell management. We say, hey, guys, we found a material misstatement. You've got to fix it. If they fix it, great. If they don't, it impacts on the audit opinion. So this concept of materiality is incredibly, incredibly important. Okay? Now, on that note... The next, and by the way, let me just highlight one more thing. This happens at the planning stage of the audit. So the very beginning of the audit, we set this threshold. We select an, a base, we multiply it by percentage, and we get our materiality threshold. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called planning materiality. Why? Because it's, conduct, it's determined at the planning stage. Ladies and gentlemen, you haven't done any testing yet. You haven't conducted any procedures. So it's purely at the very beginning of the audit. Then you go ahead and you start performing your actual audit procedures. Yes? 
Sorry, can you repeat that louder? Did you say uh, the order gives sense and change the change? Yes. Yes, it does. And we'll talk about that a bit later on when we get to that stage. But yes, we do. So then we go ahead and we perform our order procedures and we collect our evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, at that point in time, based on the, the procedures that we've performed and the testing that we've conducted and the evidence that we have gathered, we might need to, I'll put this in a different red, we might need to revise that reference point. We might need to revise this threshold. Based off the testing results that we have collated, we might decide, hmm, the original threshold that we have, that's not appropriate. We need to go back and we need to revise it. Now, please be mindful, revisal can be upwards or downwards, okay? So we might need to increase it to, say, $3,000 or decrease it to $1,000. Either way, the revised materiality, ladies and gentlemen, is called performance materiality. So the premise, the understanding is still the same. We're still using it as the reference point to determine if misstatements are material or not. The difference is when it comes about. So planning materiality is at the very beginning, once you, again, planning stage, hence the name. Once we go ahead and we start doing our processing and our testing, if we feel that we need to revise it, that's when it becomes a performance materiality number, okay? Again, same premise. We're still using it in the same way. It's just a revised number. Now, one more thing that I want to mention is that the materiality threshold that we come up with, we can provide it for the entire, we can use it for the entire set of financials. Or what's actually more likely to happen is we'll actually come up with a materi materiality threshold for each account. So we'll say that in, for cash, my materiality threshold for cash is $5,000. For sales revenue, my materiality threshold is $10,000. So we can actually link it to the particular accounts. Now on that note, I need to mention one more thing to you to kind of close the, hopefully the gap of, uh, of knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, a materiality threshold, notice what I was doing here. The materiality threshold, this, this reference point, this is the maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to accept before it impacts on my audit opinion, right? So if this is $20,000, actually, let me resist. If it's $2,000, then the maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to accept is $2,000. As soon as it goes higher, it's going to impact on my audit opinion. So if you want, another way of thinking about it is it's the maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to tolerate, okay? So that's another way. And by the way, um, can you please write this down as well? That's why sometimes it's referred to as tolerable misstatement. Tolerable misstatement, why? Because it's the maximum amount of misstatement we'll be willing to tolerate before it impacts on our audit opinion. So that's really important. But again, it can be used at the whole at financial level or per account. This is more likely. Now this diagram basically goes through exactly what we've already discussed in the sense that at the beginning of the audit, we set a planning materiality. Remember, I call it a materiality threshold, right? The reason I call it that is because that's actually the terminology we use in industry. We use materiality threshold. And again, in your textbooks, another way that they name it is by referring to it as preliminary assessment of materiality right? Because it happens at the beginning. So it's a preliminary assessment. Then you do your testing and you might determine that you need to actually revise that number. And that's when it becomes performance materiality. Again, you're using it the same way. It's just that this one, at this point in time, you've conducted some testing uh, that influences your ability to re revise it. Okay? It's still that threshold. It's still your reference point in determining whether the misstatement is material or not. Now, I've started mentioning this to you already, but I'll just uh, bring it back to your understanding. Remember, materiality threshold, it's the maximum amount of misstatement we are willing to tolerate. All right? Anything above it is material. It's going to impact on our audit opinion if they don't change it. Anything below is not material, so it's not going to impact on our audit opinion. As I said to you, and I'm just going to include it here, as I said to you, the way that we actually uh, go about determining this, this threshold is we select a particular base account, we multiply it by a certain percentage, and the result of that calculation is your materiality threshold. Now, what do I want to emphasize, guys? There is a great amount of judgment involved in this process. Why? Well, you need to decide what base account to use. That's judgment. 
You need to decide what percentage to multiply by. That's judgment. Okay, now what I'm trying to highlight to you is that throughout the audit process, we exercise a lot of a great deal of judgment. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is another reason why it's impossible for us to give absolute assurance, why it's impossible for us to give a 100% guarantee. Why? Because not only do we not test all the transactions, we take a sample, we also exercise a great deal of judgment as part of the process. So giving 100% assurance is, is a no-no. We can't do it. It's impossible. Now, on that note, what I would like to focus on is how we come up with the base, how we make this decision and how we make this decision. The first one I just want to mention is the base account. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's two considerations we have in selecting what base to use to, to, to calculate materiality threshold. The first thing that we consider is we want something that's relevant. What does that mean? Uh, net profit before tax, that's relevant. Why? What do I mean by that? I mean it's a good indication of how the business is performing. Net profit before tax, that's a good indication as to how the business is performing. Another good indication is sales revenue. So often those two bases are common bases that can be used to determine materiality threshold. Why? They're a good reflection of how the business is performing. Here's the issue. Sometimes net profit before tax and sales revenue fluctuate. They go up and down, up and down, up and down, depending on how the industry is performing, how the economy is impacting on that business and so on and so forth. As a result, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my second point. With the base that we use, we often want that base to not only be relevant, but also we want it to be stable. We want it to be consi relatively consistent over time. Now, what are some bases we use in that regard? Total assets and total equity. Because the total assets and the total equity of a business often stay quite consistent. They don't dramatically increase and decrease very often. So they provide stability, right? So you need to be mindful. There are a bunch of different bases that we can use in this calculation, but we'd like to use a base that's relevant, but also is somewhat uh, stable. Again, what do you end up choosing is a matter of judgment. And ladies and gentlemen, juniors would not be making this decision. It would be the decision of a senior personnel on the audit team. So whether it's the partner or a senior manager, okay? The second thing is the percentage. And I'm gonna provide you some guidance as to uh, what the accounting standards say we should use, use as a percentage. But essentially, in both of these instances, judgment is required. Now, one more thing that I'd like to highlight to you all and I'd like everybody to do this actually, can you please highlight or underline the fact that materiality is a relative concept? What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, materiality, what that threshold number, what your reference point is going to be, will come down to the business. What do I mean? The size of the business. What is significant, what is material, what is important and will impact on a user's decision in often cases will come down to, well, what's the business that you're talking about? What's the context? Let me give you an example. A $1,000 misstatement is, let me ask you this question actually, would a $1,000 misstatement be significant for Coca-Cola? No. What about if it's for a small business um, that is a mum and dad business, for example? Yes or no? Most likely, yes or no? So what I mean by that is what is deemed to be significant, so material, comes down to the concept. So the context, I should say. Company size is a really good indication of that. Let me give you one example. One of my, so company size. One of my biggest client, actually my biggest client was IAG. So IAG is the parent company for insurance businesses like NRMA and CGU. And I was involved in auditing the consolidated entity. So if you've done ABC, you know consolidated entity is the parent and the subsidiaries all together, the big family, essentially. Now, on that audit, listen very carefully, and this is a really great example of how size impacts on what is deemed to be material. Of that, of that in that audit engagement, my materiality threshold was $14 million. That was my reference point. So if I found misstatements of 13 mil, not significant, right? Why? Because given the size of that company, it wasn't significant, okay? Now compare that to my smallest client. My smallest client was a small charity and it was so small that I conducted the, client, uh, the audit in three days and I sat in the living room of the owner of the charity, so that's how small it was. 
and her dog was kind of going around the whole time as I was sitting at the dining table. And my materiality threshold for that client, $500. Yeah? So this just goes to show it's a relative term. It comes down to the context in which you are applying this concept. The larger the business, the higher the materiality threshold would be. Yes? If you find something that's below the threshold, mm -hmm. would you still have to bring it? Is there a or you can just Fantastic question. She just said that if it's below the threshold, would you still communicate that to management? I'm going to address that soon. Okay, number one, we don't ignore anything. So we do note down all, we keep track of all the misstatements, whether it's material or not, because we want to look at all of them together as well. All right, so I'll, I'll address that soon. Now, the second point here, ladies and gentlemen, goes back to the base that we use. And as I mentioned, in some instances, we use profit before tax or sales revenue because it's a good indicator of the business's performance. But if we want something that's more stable, then we can use total asset or total equity, okay? Again, this is the base upon which we multiply the percentage to get the materiality threshold. One more thing, the materiality threshold, ladies and gentlemen, is a number. What does that mean? It means it's a numerical measure. It means that what we, if you want to use a technical term, it's a quantitative measure, it's a number. But you need to be mindful. If you go back to what I said at the beginning, something can be deemed to be material because of its amount, but also its what? What was it? Nature. And that's why we also consider qualitative factors. We also consider the nature of the misstatement. So please don't be misguided as to we only care about the number. No. When it comes to the number, we compare it to materiality threshold because that's our reference point. But we also always consider the nature of the, of the misstatement as well. Remember, fraud is significant purely because of its nature. Okay? So we do not disregard that in this process. Now, as I said to you, I provided guidance about the base that we use. This is the guidance regarding the percentage. Now, listen very carefully here. The first thing I'd like to mention is AASB 1030, whoops, 1031, ladies and gentlemen, AASB 1031, one more time, AASB 1031 is an accounting standard. It's not an auditing standard. It's an accounting standard. And that accounting standard deals with materiality. And it provides guidelines as to the percentage that we should be using. Now, this is interesting because what it says is that an amount that is equal to or greater than 10% of the base that we have selected, you can assume that to be material. So anything that is equal to or higher than 10% of your base, that's material. Alternatively, um, an amount that is equal to or less than 5% of your chosen base can be deemed to be not material, right? So if it's 10% or higher, material. 5% or lower, not material. What's left? The gap. Ladies and gentlemen, a matter of judgment. PJ, professional judgment. Again, highlighting how much judgment is involved in this process. So there are some guidelines as to the, the percentages that you can use, but nothing is an absolute, um, it, it's not a rule, okay? It's a guideline, it's not a rule. So there is a great deal of judgment involved. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can use the materiality threshold for the entire set of financials, but we are more likely to use it on a per account basis. So please be mindful of that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier as well, and this is why I mentioned the terminology, remember your materiality threshold is the maximum amount of misstatement you're willing to tolerate. Ladies and gentlemen, the heading, that's why it's called tolerable misstatement. It's the maximum amount of misstatement you're willing to tolerate. So another term they use is tolerable misstatement. And as I said, it can be allocated to individual accounts. Okay? So we can say, well, the maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to accept uh, in sales revenue is $10,000. The maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to accept in cash is $5,000. So you can split it up per account. Now, we are coming to Shoshana's uh, question earlier. We do keep a worksheet of all the misstatements. So we actually keep track of all misstatements, whether they are material or not. And the reason for that is if you find many, many, many uh, small misstatements, they might all add up to one big one, okay? So we do want to keep track of everything. We don't ignore anything, right? So we do have that guideline, but we still do keep track of all the misstatements that we find. And on that note, there are two types of misstatements. 
we have what's called known misstatements. Now, what's that? A known misstatement is a misstatement you know is there because you found it. Here's a good example. So say that you were looking at a particular invoice and the total of that invoice was $10,000. You then compared that invoice to the journal, the, the debit and the credit, and you found that for that invoice, the debit and credit, the amount that was input, so the amount that was posted was $8,000. Ladies and gentlemen, the difference of the 2,000, that's a known misstatement. Why? Because you just found it. You know it's there. Okay? That's different to the next one, which is likely misstatements. Now, this is one's a bit interesting. I'm about to draw a diagram to help uh, explain this one to you. But a likely misstatement is a misstatement you think is likely there because of the testing that you have conducted. Let me explain this one using a diagram. So... First of all, ladies and gentlemen, if we are looking at all of the sales revenue of a particular company, do we test every single transaction, yes or no? No, no we take a sample. So let's just say that the total amount of sales revenue was $100,000. So this whole amount of transactions was $100,000. Now, we're not going to go and test the whole thing. Sorry. We're just going to take a sample. Remember, a sample is a smaller group or a smaller subset within that whole population. Now we take this smaller group and we test it. So this is my sample. And the value of my sample, the total value of my sample say is $10,000, okay? Now I, I test all of those items, I test all of those transactions and I find an error, a total error of $2,000, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. If I tested $10,000 worth of data or transactions and I found a $2,000 in total, $2,000 error, what percentage is that of the sample? 20%. This is important. Write that one down. It's worth 20%. So what does that mean? That means that of the sample that I've tested, 20%, there was an error rate of 20%. Now, I, am, I do have a point here. I'm going to take this back. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to come up with a conclusion about the whole population. But because we can't go and test the whole population, we take a sample and we test a sample and we get our testing results. Now remember, you are assuming that the sample that you have selected represents the whole group. What does that mean? Here's your link. If this sample reflects the whole group and you found a 20% error in that sample, you know what that means? That means that you believe there's a 20% error in the whole group. So you do this process, and the process is called projection. You project the error onto the whole group. What does that mean? That means you take that 20% and you multiply it to the total value of that population. Now, what's $100,000 multiplied by 20%? 20,000. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your likely misstatement. It's the misstatement you think is there given the results of your testing. And again, the, the uh, process I just described, guys, it's projection. And that's literally the way I visually always show it. It's projecting the result from the sample to the whole population. Because remember, the assumption is that the sample that you selected represented the whole population. So if you found an error in the sample, it reflects error in the population. Hence why you project this, this percentage. Okay, now we will be discussing this further in the coming weeks, but this is the best way I could think of explaining what a likely misstatement is. Now, just really quickly, I want to show you how this one works. So I want you to think about this as the total misstatements that you found, and I want you to think about this as your materiality threshold for each account. So I'm just going to do two of these because I am running out of time slightly. Um, and the, what I would like you to think about is for cash, oops, sorry, for the account cash, your materiality threshold was $4,000. That's the maximum amount of error you're willing to tolerate. The misstatements that you found was $2,000. Ladies and gentlemen, is the $2,000 a material misstatement, yes or no? No. Why, Benji? It's not 4K. It's not 4K. Is it more than 4K or less than 4K? That's your answer. Okay, if it's below your materiality threshold, it's not material. It's only material if it's above. Let's do this for inventory. 
For inventory, your materiality threshold is $36,000. The misstatements, $47,250. Ladies and gentlemen, is this a material misstatement, yes or no? Yes. Excellent. And that's how it works. All right, fantastic. In that case, because it was per account, you focus on it per account, yeah. Now, order evidence. So we're going to speed things up just a little bit, but very quickly, what I would like everyone to include in their notes, first and foremost, is ASA 500, ladies and gentlemen, ASA 500. ASA 500 is the standard that deals with audit evidence. Very important that you do refer to this standard. Now, in particular, let me just describe to you what paragraph 5 says. Paragraph 5 of ASA 500 provides a definition of what audit evidence is. Quite simply, ladies and gentlemen, it is any evidence, any, any evidence, any information that we use to get to our final conclusion. Any evidence that we use, any information that we use to get to our final opinion is called audit evidence. Now, that can be electronic. It could be through emails or something. It can be a hard copy, so documentary evidence, so on paper. It can also be verbal evidence. Any information that we use to get to our final opinion is classified as this concept of audit uh, evidence. Okay? Now... Paragraph 6 of ASA 500, so I'll just mention paragraph 6, goes on to say, and this is important, goes on to say, I'll do this in red, that the auditor must collect, and listen very carefully here, the auditor must collect sufficient, appropriate audit evidence. Now, what does that mean? We're going to split up these two terms and deal with them separately. The first one is sufficient. Ladies and gentlemen, sufficient relates to quantity. It's talking about the need to collect enough audit evidence. So it's, a, it's an amount measure, making sure we have enough quantity of evidence, right? So we have enough in terms of the amount. The other concept to be very mindful of is appropriate audit evidence. What does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? Quality. It's not only enough for us to have a good amount of evidence, we also need evidence that is of high quality. Another term I'd like you to use in this regard is reliable. So we want enough audit evidence that is reliable to support our audit opinion at the end of the day. Again, ASA 500 is your reference, and in particular, paragraph 6 is what specifies that the auditor needs to have sufficient, appropriate audit evidence. So please be mindful of that. Now, the nature of the evidence, you can have a read of this paragraph, but the key thing I'm just going to highlight, uh, purely because it relates to what we just said, is that audit evidence is necessary to support the auditor's opinion and report. And secondly, it is obtained from the audit procedures performed during the course of the audit. So the evidence is the information that you collect as part of the procedures that you perform. On that note, the procedures that you perform, ladies and gentlemen, are all outlined in your audit program. An audit program or an audit plan is a detailed list of all the instructions that set out what audit procedures are going to be conducted, how much testing is going to be conducted, and when it's going to be conducted, right? So essentially, I'll do this one in green, what's happening is the, the audit program sets out exactly how the audit is going to work in terms of what the procedures are going to be. By the way, nature. Nature refers to what type of procedures are we going to conduct? Timing. When are we going to conduct these procedures? Extent. How much testing are we going to perform? How much evidence are we going to collect? So all of these uh, concepts and all of these things are noted down in the audit plan or the audit program. All right? So that's where the link comes through. Now, again, this does reiterate the fact that the audit program is a list of the procedures, but it includes how much we're going to test in terms of the sample size. So what sample are we going to select and then test? Uh, exactly what are we testing and when we're going to perform the, the procedures. But in particular, guys, I just want to be mindful and make note of the term recipe. The audit program, the instructions, they're the recipe. 
they're guiding you as to how you're going to conduct the audit, just the way a recipe guides you in how you're going to cook a particular meal. Now, the reason why that term is there is because Amanda White, who uh, used to be the coordinator for this subject, the way that she used to always explain an audit program is she used to say, it's like a recipe for fried rice. And she used to always follow it up by saying, there's more than one way of making fried rice. Why is that important? Ladies and gentlemen, in this subject, it's going to be highly rare to have a situation where there's only one correct answer. Very rare. I'm going to start introducing you to all the different types of audit procedures that we can do. And the great thing about it is that you can start being creative. You can think about a situation and think, well, how can I test this? There are more than one way of testing an assertion. There's more than one way of testing an account. So please be mindful of that. The, the skills that you're going to develop in this, in this particular subject, it's different to other subjects. Why? Because you have free reign a little bit. As long as you can justify your thinking process and it makes logical sense, you're going to be okay. But you need to step out of your comfort zone and stop thinking, oh, what's the right answer? Sometimes there are multiple right answers, okay? So just start thinking about that. And as Amanda says, there's more than one way of making fried rice, okay? On that note, the persuasiveness of evidence, again, comes down to those two concepts. Competence, which, by the way, if you'd like to write this down, actually, I'm doing purple. Competence, ladies and gentlemen, um, just means, uh, well, I'll write appropriate to link it back to the term we used. Competence means the appropriateness of the evidence. Another way for you to write it down is reliability, is what it's talking about. Again, linking back to what we discussed, there is two elements when it comes to audit evidence. You want it to be, number one, sufficient, so you want to have enough evidence, but you also want it to be appropriate, which means you want it to be of high quality and evidence that you can actually rely upon. So on that note, there are factors that uh, determine both of these, so we're going to go through both of them. Here we go. Reliability, there are a certain number of factors that influence how reliable information can be. So we're about to go through each one. Uh, I'll keep it as yellow. Here we go. In order for the audit evidence to be uh, reliable, you want it to be relevant. Now, what does that mean? In the slide, it says relevant means that it's relevant to the audit objective. I'm just going to provide you with a bit more ex explanation. And uh, let me say it this way. Audit evidence is relevant when it actually links back to what it is you're trying to test. Let me give you an example. If you're testing uh, sales revenue, then evidence that would be relevant are things like if you're looking at a sales invoice, because that links back to sales revenue. If you're looking at a customer's sales order, because that links back to sales revenue. If you're looking at uh, the sales journals, that links back to sales revenue. So these are all relevant. What would not be relevant? The policy on depreciation. Okay, so what's relevant is you want to make sure that the evidence, the information you are using actually relates back to the thing you're focusing on. Okay, that's what relevant means. The second factor is the independence of the provider. Now, this one's really important. And what I suggest everyone to do is to write the word source next to it. The source of the evidence is a, is a really important indicator of how reliable that evidence is. Let me ask you all a question. Which one do you think is more reliable? Do you think it's more reliable if the evidence is uh, prepared by the client or if the evidence is prepared by another third party? I need more than two people to answer that question. So one more time. Is it more reliable if it's prepared by the client or somebody else outside of the client? Outside. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to write this down, external sources of information are more reliable than internal sources of information. Why? Ladies and gentlemen, as soon as evidence passes through or is generated by the client before it gets to us, it loses a bit of reliability. Why? The risk of manipulation. Yeah? Let me tell you an example. <clears throat> I don't know what client this was for, and it wasn't me personally, it was one of my friends, but basically what happened in a particular uh, audit engagement was that the client gave the auditor their bank statement. Right? Now, as we all know, because we all have our bank accounts, the bank statement is prepared by the bank and then they send it to you. Okay? It used to be all in paper, now some of you might get it online. So what happened was the client, so the bank had prepared the statement, sent it to the client, and the client provided it to the auditor. Are we all okay so far? 
One more fact of the case. The document that they provided to the auditor was a photocopy. So it wasn't the original, it was a photocopy. Okay? That is important later on in the, in the, in the, in the case. So what happened was they looked at the bank statement, they noted um, how much money the, the, the client had in their bank account, and then the, the auditor thought, I'm just going to confirm this, by the way, confirm is going to come up later, but I'm going to confirm this with the bank. So they spoke to the bank and said, hey, can you just confirm uh, the amount that is in the bank account of this client? Number came back, totally different. Long story short, what they found out was that the client, the reason why it was a photocopy, is because the client had used liquid paper on the original bank statement, changed the number, photocopied it so you couldn't see the liquid paper, and then gave it to the auditor. Ladies and gentlemen, what am I trying to get back to? External sources of information, much more reliable than internal. As soon as information is prepared by the client or passes through the client to get to us, there's a risk that they might manipulate it. So therefore, the source of the information is very, very, very important, okay? Because that, there's that risk as soon as it goes to the client. The other element or the other factor that we consider is the effectiveness of the client's internal controls. Ladies and gentlemen, if we think the controls in the business are really good and they're really effective to make sure the process is conducted correctly without any issues, so if we think the controls are good, the systems are good, we can rely more on the information that comes out of the system. So think about it this way. If we think that the, inf that the system that the business uses is effective and it's the controls are working, the checks are working and things are happening correctly, then we're more likely to find the information that comes out of the system reliable. And that's pretty logical thinking as well. Okay? Next one is directors, sorry, the auditor's direct knowledge. What does that mean? Ladies and gentlemen, if we collect evidence ourselves, it's more reliable than if we just ba based it on what the client told us. Let me give you an example. If we go and we count the number of inventory ourselves, then we are, are more likely to place like, greater reliance on that than if the client told us how much inventory they had. Okay? So if you collect the information yourself, it's more reliable than if you get it from the client. Next one, qualifications of the individuals providing the information. Unless the individuals are qualified, the information they provide you cannot be deemed to be reliable. So they need to be qualified in order to give you that information. Degree of objectivity, ladies and gentlemen. Information that is, or I should say audit evidence that is objective is much more reliable than audit evidence that is subjective. Now, if you don't know what these mean, subjective means it requires a great deal of judgment. Objective means it doesn't require that much judgment. So as a result, this is more reliable than this. Okay, and that's what this element is, uh, is referring to. The final one is timeliness. I'm just going to speed things up a little bit. Yep. Timeliness. Uh, depending... Sorry, there you go. Timeliness. Now, this one I'm going to explain to you in, a, in another way. I'm actually going to split it up in terms of if we're looking at a balance sheet and an income statement. Okay. Oops. Income statement. Balance sheet. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a really quick question. On the balance sheet, when we prepare a balance sheet, there are three lines on the very top. So the, the heading is three lines. The first line says the company's name. The second line says this is a balance sheet. What does the third line say? Excellent. It says as at, for example, the 30th of June, 2016. It's the time section. Now, why am I referring to this? As at, ladies and gentlemen, the balance sheet is a snapshot at one point in time. It's telling you about the assets, the liabilities, and the equity of the business as at that point in time. How does it link back to order evidence? Because it's talking about and focusing on that certain point in time, which, by the way, let me just mention, so it's here, like the 30th of June, what that means is we would like to collect evidence that supports what the value was at that point in time. Okay? Now you might be thinking, right, let me explain to you the difference here. An income statement, what does the third line of the income statement say? It doesn't say as at? For the period ending, absolutely. Because what an income statement does is it's for a certain period of time. A balance sheet 
is accumulated totals as at a certain point in time. An income statement is over a period of time. Now again, what's the link back? With the balance sheet, we want, because we're focusing on that point in time, we want to gain evidence around that point in time. With an income statement, we want to gain evidence over the whole period of time. Why? To gain comfort over the whole period. That's the difference. So again, depending on which one you're focusing on, if it's balance sheet items or income statement transactions, the period of time you're, you're focusing on collecting evidence will be different. Okay? And again, by the way, this was just basic accounting. So don't under underestimate the value of that. Sufficiency. So we talked about all the different factors that impact on the reliability of information, but now about the sufficiency. Remember, sufficiency is about quantity. It's about the amount of evidence that is needed. Now, the biggest uh, measure of that, ladies and gentlemen, is a sample size. Okay, it's a sample size. If we want to collect more evidence, we increase our sample size. If we want to collect less evidence, we decrease our sample size. Here's what I'd like to mention to you all. I will not, I repeat, I will not get you to calculate sample size. That's not what's going to happen in this subject. The reason for that is once you start getting into industry, what you'll notice very quickly is that every single audit firm has a different way of calculating sample size. Right? Because there's no common way, I don't want to teach you that because that's not going to help you. Rather, what I am going to be testing you on is your ability to read a situation and be able to identify that, okay, given this situation, would I want to collect more evidence? So would I want to have a bigger sample size or a smaller sample size? On that note, let's start testing that now. So if we expect, if the auditor expects there to be a lot of misstatements, would that result in us taking a bigger sample or a smaller sample? Try again. If we expect that there's going to be a lot of error, a lot of misstatements, oh. would, <laughs> if we expect there to be a lot of misstatements, would we pick more items or less items to test? Absolutely. So what I would like you to know is that that will result in a bigger sample size. Let's go to the next one. If we're talking about the internal controls within the business, I'll come back, Manji. When we're talking about the internal controls of the business, if we think the controls are really good, the system that the business uses is really good, it's good at checking the information and preventing issues and detecting issues, would that result in a bigger or a smaller sample size? Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the skill I want you to develop. On that note, if you go to ASA 500 and you go to the appendix of ASA 500, it provides a list of situations and how you would respond in terms of would you have a bigger or an increased sample size or a decrease. That's what I would like you to work on. I'm not going to get you to calculate, but I do need you to understand this. Yes, Benji? So I'm thinking about statistics. Yep. Now, the bigger sample size, you actually use less error? We're not going to get through that. Yeah, don't, don't bring statistics into it because that's going to overcomplicate. Um, not necessarily in response to actual, your actual question. Not necessarily. Okay. All right, this is a summary, so I'll let you go through that yourselves. It basically goes through uh, all the things that we just spoke about in terms of the factors that impact on reliability and the factors that, rely, that impact on the uh, amount or the sufficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, what I need everyone to do is to highlight this whole slide. Do an asterisk, do whatever you need to do to know that this is an incredibly, incredibly important topic or slide. And uh, what I would like you to also do is instead of having the term evidence, can you please cross that out and write procedures? Because these are actually not the audit evidence types, they're the procedure types, they're the procedures that we conduct. So very important that you um, understand that. Now, in saying that, what I, would like you, what I would like to identify and highlight at this point is the flow-on process. So what happens, ladies and gentlemen, is that we perform procedures, which I'm about to go through with you. So we perform procedures. It's by performing the procedures that we gather the evidence or the audit evidence. And the evidence supports, here we go back, your assertions. This is really important for you to start seeing the links here. So essentially what I'm telling you is that the procedures that you conduct are linked to the assertions you are trying to test. So the evidence is supporting those assertions. All right? Very important that you start seeing the links because here's what you're going to soon realise. 
some of the procedures are actually more effective for certain assertions. Okay, so once you start seeing those links, it's going to make your job much easier. All right, so on that note, let's get, oh, and by the way, one more thing. The evidence that you collect, as I said, is supporting the assertions. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to perform procedures and gather evidence to support the fact that for all the income statement transactions, I'm trying to get evidence to support that all those income statement transactions really, number one, occurred. Secondly, were completely recorded. Thirdly, they were recorded accurately. Fourthly, they were recorded in the right accounting period, which is cut off. And fifth, they were recorded in the right accounts, which is classification. Do you see the link there? You need to start seeing the links. On the balance sheet, I want to collect evidence to support that all the balance sheet items really do exist, right? They were completely recorded. They were valued and allocated correctly. And finally, they had the right or the obligation to include it. All right, so that's how you link it back. So let's get straight into it. The first one is physical examination. Physical examination, as the name suggests, is when you physically examine, here we go, an asset. Okay, you physically examine an asset. Now, let me ask you a question. If you physically examine an asset, ladies and gentlemen, which assertion are you gaining comfort over? Absolutely, write that down. Existence, fantastic. You're starting to see the links already. Okay, by looking at something and knowing it is there, it gives you comfort that it indeed exists. Okay, now the, uh, the assets that we are more likely to actually perform this procedure for is inventory and cash, because they're the ones that you can more likely physically see. Oh, and by the way, property, plants and equipment as well. So your machinery, your factories and so on and so forth. So it helps you with existence. Now, the other thing I just want to mention is by physically examining an asset, you can also see it's con the condition of the asset. Now, why is that important? It's important because, let me ask you a question. If you look at an asset, if you look at an asset and it looks really old and really rusty and it looks like they can't use it, would that result in you thinking the asset should be valued at a high level or a low level? Yeah. So it also provides a little bit of support regarding valuation and allocation. Now, notice what I said, I said a little bit. Why? Because you can generally think of should it be high, should it be low, but not accurate enough for it to actually be supporting that assertion. So it provides some indicator, but not, it's not complete. Now, like I said before, some assertions will not actually be related to certain, um, sorry, some procedures will not relate to certain assertions. For example, if you physically examine or physically look at an asset, does that mean that the business actually owned that asset? Can you think of a situation where the asset is there in the business and we can see it, but they don't actually own it? Lease, anything else? C, it starts with a C. Consignment. Consignment's the other one, okay? So please be mindful. It provides evidence over existence, but not evidence over rights and obligations. And as I said, it doesn't provide evidence over valuation because it's not accurate enough. Finally, completeness. Does, by looking at an asset, does that... Can, uh, does that make sure, or does that give you a support that all the assets have been included, yes or no? Not unless you look at all of them. So it's an insufficient procedure for completeness as well. Confirmations, I started talking about these earlier. Confirmations, and what I would like you all to add is the term external. They're external confirmations. Now, what does that mean? It's basically a letter, oops, sorry. External. It's a letter that we send a third party and we request of them to please confirm a certain piece of information. For example, we contact the bank and we say, uh, can you please confirm that this is how much money is in the bank account of this client? Or we contact the customer and we say, hey customer, can you please confirm that you owe the business this much money? Right? So we are confirming information with a third party. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the key. Because we're confirming information with a third party, this is the most reliable form of evidence. Why? The client's not involved in this process at all. It literally goes from auditor to third party and back. The client is not involved in this process at all. As a result, it's the most reliable procedure.
okay? Now we have two different types. We have a positive form of, of confirmation. What does that mean? That's the one where we request the recipient, the person that we're sending it to, we request of them to, uh, to get back to us in all circumstances. What does that mean? If it's right or if it's wrong. So if the, if the information is correct or if the information is incorrect, we'd like them to respond to us in either case. That's different to a negative form because a negative form only requ requires the recipient to get back to us if the information is incorrect, all right? That's the difference. So negative form, we only need them to get back to us if it's wrong. Positive form, we'd like them to respond either way. Here's my question. With the negative form, there's a limitation. With the negative form, we want them to respond to us if the information is wrong. So if they don't respond to us, what are we assuming? That it's right. Now, does that necessarily, is that going to be true all the time? No. You know why? The biggest limitation, even though this is the most reliable form of evidence, the limitation is we hardly get them back. We send them, we just don't get them back. In practice, it's only between 5 to 10% of confirmations we send that actually come back to us. As a result, this one, is flawed. Why? Because you cannot assume that the information is incorrect just if they don't get back to you. Why? Because they rarely get back to you. So between negative and positive, you're more likely to use the positive one. But even then, that has limitations as well. Let me just say one quick story. If you send a confirmation to a customer and you say, hey customer, is it true that you owe the business $20,000 and the customer checks their records and they actually owe the business $10,000, are they going to come back and say something? Repeat it. We say to them, is it true that you owe the business $20,000? They check their records and they only owe $10,000. Are they going to come back and say something? Hell yes. They'll be like, no, I don't. I only owe $10,000. What are you talking about, stupid auditor? Right? Flip it. We send a confirmation to a customer and say, is it true that you owe the business $20,000? They check their records and their records show that they owe the business $30,000. Are they going to say anything? <laughs> They're like, well done, auditor. Good job. Good job, auditor. Okay? So even a positive form has its limitations because if the customer actually owes more, they're not going to say anything. If they owe less, they will. So it's, again, one-sided. So there's limitations there. Information that we do confirm, here are some examples. I'll let you have a read. Technology, I'll be very quick here, and it relates back to what I've already told you. Because now there's so much more technology used in gathering information, a lot of the evidence that we look at is what we call electronic evidence. We're talking emails, we're talking anything that's in a computer system. As a result of that, we place much more emphasis and much more time testing the systems within the business. Why? Because if we're okay with the system, we're more okay with the information that comes out of the system. That's all I really want to say there. But we do focus quite a lot on the IT systems um, to gain comfort of the information that comes out of them. Now, something else that we do is we inspect documentation. Right? We look at documents. Now, those documents can be internal, which means developed uh, or prepared by the client. They can also be external, which is when they're prepared by anybody else outside of the client. Which one did we say is more reliable, internal or external? External, very good. Um, and basically, we can look at these documents to, to do tracing or vouching, which is something I'm going to talk about a bit later. So these are the external documents. So you can have exa examples like a supplier invoice and so on and so forth. And I will come back to this later. Observation is the next one. Observation, ladies and gentlemen, people generally get confused between observation and uh, inspection. And the difference between the two is inspection is when you generally physically do something yourself, whereby observation is when you watch somebody else do it. For example, if I physically, sorry, if I actually count the number of chairs in this room, I'm inspecting it. If I watch somebody, if I watch Benji do it, I'm observing. Okay, so when you do it yourself, it's inspecting. When you watch somebody else do it, it's observing. So please be mindful of that distinction. So often, that's the key thing there. When you watch others do something, it's called observation. Now, let me ask you a question. If you know someone is watching you, are you more likely or less likely to do the right thing? <laughs> Absolutely. Does that mean you always do the right thing? You guys, of course, but somebody else. Yeah? Not necessarily. So observation, again, as a procedure, is quite limited. Why? Because if someone knows they're being watched, obviously they're going to do the right thing. 
That doesn't necessarily mean they're always doing the right thing. So it's insufficient on its own. We usually couple with, with another procedure that provides a bit more quality evidence. Inquiries, we talk to the client. Now, inquiring with the client and getting a response from them can be through email and it can also be through uh, through uh, face to face communication. All right, so it can result in both written evidence and also oral evidence as well. And again, on its own, it's absolutely insufficient. We want to gain further evidence to support the claims that management and the client are making to us. So again, it's one type of evidence, but it's very basic. So you want to get other evidence to support it. For example, looking at inspecting documents. Recalculation is when, as the name suggests, you recalculate something uh, mathematically. Okay, so if you're looking at an invoice and you know that the business sold five tables, listen very carefully, five tables and each table was $100, what would be the total on the invoice? Excellent. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Wonderful. Now that's recalculation. Now that's a very simple example. We perform recalculation quite a lot. In particular, and by the way, we do this using one of my favorite tools, Excel. And just a side note, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not already employed, actually, even if you are employed, improving your Excel skills will only benefit you. Trust me. Trust me. There are courses that you can do even on YouTube, right? But Excel is a fantastic skill to have. Very, very good. And that, if you're applying for a grad role and you're including something like that on your resume, you will stand out. Don't underestimate the importance of little things like that. If you, can do, if you understand how to use Excel, number one, you're more efficient as an employee. Okay, so please do look into that side note. Come back here. Um, so we do use Excel for, in particular when we're doing uh, like depreciation recalculation. So we'll get all the, the information about the assets, we'll put it in and we'll recalculate what we think depreciation should be. So that's what we can do. We also do that for prepaid assets. Now on that note, guys, let me just ask you a very quick question. If we are doing uh, the pro procedure of recalculation for depreciation, what assertion are we testing? If it's for depreciation expense, if we're testing the dollar amount, what is it? Accuracy. You got to be careful here. You got to start seeing the links. So if you're looking at the dollar amount, first of all, it's either accuracy or valuation and allocation. It's accuracy if it's a revenue or an expense, and it's valuation and allocation if it's balance sheet item. So please be mindful. So with depreciation, if you're testing depreciation expense, then the assertion is accuracy. If you're testing accumulated depreciation, then it's valuation and allocation. Please be mindful. Go back to your journals because, by the way, if you just went back to the normal depreciation, ex uh, depreciation journal, debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. Guys, there is no account. There is no account that sits by itself. Every account has a brother or a sister account. Why? Because we do double entry accounting, right? Always go back to your journal to identify your accounts and then you'll go to the assertion from there. Reperformance is when we reperform a process the same way that the client did to see if we get the same results. Now you might be thinking, well, how is that different to recalculation? Recalculation is specifically checking a calculation. It's about an actual number. Reperformance, however, is more about a process. Okay, now because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to do this one here. But basically, when you go from a source document, what, is that, what do I mean? If you go from uh, a customer sales order or you go from a sales invoice and you match that against the accounting record, so you match that against the journal, ladies and gentlemen, that procedure, and I'd like you all to write this down, that's called tracing. So tracing is when you start at the beginning of the process and you trace through the, through, through the process to match it to the journal at the end. That's tracing. Now listen to me very carefully because we're going to start linking one more thing. If you are starting at the beginning of a process and you're tracing it all the way through to the end to make sure it is there and it has been recorded, what's the assertion you're testing? Completeness, that's absolutely right. Why? You're making sure it was recorded. 
Now, the other type of procedure you can do is the opposite direction. You can start at the debit or credit. You can start at the journal and then match it backwards to the original supporting documentation. So you can match it back to the sales invoice or you can match it back to the original sales order. Ladies and gentlemen, that process is called vouching. Now, listen to me very carefully. If you're starting at the journal, and you are vouching it back to the supporting documentation, here we go, to make sure that it was real, what assertion are you testing? Existence, if it's an asset or a liability, what else? Occurrence, if it's a transaction, absolutely. So again, I'm trying to show you that each of these procedures, they are linked to the assertions. You need to practice. Okay, you need to practice, but well done. So tracing is going forward, vouching is going backwards. Analytical procedures is the last procedure, um, and basically we, we touched on this one last week, but the key thing I want to mention here is, remember, analytical procedures come down to three main things, what we are doing. Number one, ratios. Number two, comparison. So if we're comparing last year to this year, or this year to budget, or something like that. And the last one is trend analysis. And that's why we're looking at it in percentage terms. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know these. You need to know these. You need to know these. You need to know these in particular. Okay? Guys, all jokes aside, um, you really need to know your ratios. And I've said this to you before and I'm going to say it again. Accounting knowledge, we build on that in this subject. You need to know your ratios. In particular, you need to know the different ratios that fall under liquidity, solvency, and profitability. By the way, you learned this in accounting B, okay? If you don't remember it, you need to go back. You will need that for the next class that you attend and the next quiz that you do. Yes? So you're not doing FSA Pretty much, okay? So please make sure you know it. Um, yeah. So things like inventory turnover ratio, you need to know what is that ratio telling me about the business? The accounts receivable turnover ratio, what's that ratio telling me about the business? Okay, Debt to equity, what is that telling me about the business? You need to know these. Why? Because once you understand what the ratio is telling you, you're able to identify, does this ratio make sense? And if it doesn't, ding, 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 likelihood of material misstatement. So it's really important that you know it. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to do this myself. If I was doing trend analysis for sales revenue and COGS, and I noticed that sales revenue went up by 30% from last year, and COGS also went up, but only by 5%. Ladies and gentlemen, that would strike my interest. Why? That doesn't look right. And by the way, the reason why this doesn't look right is if you go back to lecture number one, before we even started the topic of account of audit, lecture number one, I asked you what the journal was when you set, make a sale. And there were two journals. There's the money flow and there's the good flow. Go back to your notes if you don't know what I'm talking about. But there are two journals. First one is you debit uh, accounts receivable or cash and you credit sales revenue. The second one, you debit COGS and you credit inventory. Why is this important? Because, ladies and gentlemen, these two accounts are linked. They're linked. And what that means when they're linked is that they actually have to go up in the same proportion. They don't go up in the same dollar amount because they're different, but they go up in the same proportion. When sales revenue goes up, COGS will also go up. So that means that the fact that these two percentage increases are very different, that's a red flag and you need to investigate it. So purely looking at that, I would think potentially that, oh, sorry, potentially, sorry, <laughs> potentially that sales revenue has been overstated, COGS has been understated, or they've forgotten to include COGS, or they've double counted their sales revenue. So again, because this looks funny, I would look into it further. Again, how would you know this? You need to understand what the ratios and what the trends mean, given the context of the business. Big data, all I want to say here is that because we now have more and more transactions, we have a lot of information, as a result, uh, the way that we deal with that is we increase our sample sizes, we do more testing now to gain comfort, and we also use computers, right? We use computers to help us to identify red flags, so we can actually see the trends in the data, and that can help us identify where things don't look quite right. 
But overall, how we can um, deal with it is we get more skilled people to come on board. Um, we, like I said, we use a computer technology, but all of these things, they're issues. Because number one, we don't actually have auditing standards that tell us how to deal with complicated data. We need people that have the right skills and we need to rely on algorithms that a lot of people don't even understand. Okay, so there are some hurdles in dealing with this. All right, what I wanted to mention here uh, in particular is when it comes to risk and materiality, because I didn't mention it before, what I'd like everyone to note down is this. The higher the risk, okay, the higher the risk, ladies and gentlemen, the lower the materiality threshold we would set. There is an inverse relationship between these two things. If we think that there's a higher risk of material misstatement, we will actually set the materiality threshold, which remember is the maximum amount of misstatement I'm willing to accept or tolerate, I would set that at a lower number. Okay, why? Because it's more risky. So the higher the risk, the lower the materiality. Now let me ask you one more question. If we're dealing with, an, with a situation that we think is high risk, high risk of material misstatement, would I do more detailed or less detailed testing? If you do more detailed testing, are you collecting more evidence or less evidence? More evidence? Fantastic. You've just linked risk to audit evidence and sufficiency of the audit evidence. Okay? So just be mindful. The higher the risk, the lower the materiality and the more testing that you do. All right? Other ways, and by the way, this links back to here. The way that we respond to risk is we change the extent, which is the amount of testing that we do, as well as the type of testing that we do. We also get more experienced staff to come on board and we might even get some experts or specialists if we think the risk is too high. And we also are much more careful when we're reviewing and as I said, we do more detailed work. Okay, more detail. Now, one thing that I haven't mentioned before because I didn't want to freak you out, but I'm just going to mention now, is that when we actually assess inherent risk and control risk and, and go through that whole process, ladies and gentlemen, we actually do that for every account and every assertion. So we actually do risk assessment, for example, with the existence of cash, with the completeness of cash, with the rights and obligations of cash. So we actually go through this in a very detailed way. For your purposes, what I want you to start thinking about is just get your head around the whole process, but you need to understand that we go down to this level of detail. We break it down to the level of accounts and the assertions relating to the accounts, okay? Now, this table is from your textbook. I'm not the biggest fan, uh, purely because what it does is it's trying to show you the relationship between audit risk, inherent risk, control risk, detection risk, and how much evidence is required. But the reason I don't like it is because in, with, when it comes to audit risk, guys, when it comes to audit risk, which is the risk that our, we will provide an incorrect audit opinion, we always want that to be low. There's no way that we would want to have a high risk that we're going to provide an incorrect audit opinion because that would just expose us to legal liability. So we always want AR, we always want audit risk to be low. That's why I'm not a big fan of this, this and this, okay? So instead of you relying on this table, we provided this one. Now, I'm just going to show you very quickly how this works, but essentially when, actually I'll do it with an example. Yes? I can't go back. Yes, that's why I also don't want you to rely on it because I don't agree with that. Because it should be, if those are low, that should be high. Yeah, excellent. That's why I don't want you to rely on it. Okay, here we go. With this one, guys, just really quickly, if we think that inherent risk and control risk of a business is very high, so we think that based on the nature of the business, there's a high risk of material misstatement, and based on the controls in the business, there's a high risk they're not going to work, so we think it's a high risk situation, would we collect more detailed or less detailed evidence? More detail, very good, so more detail. Would we want detection risk to be high, medium or low in this case? Absolutely. Ladies and, oh, just do that. Remember that the inherent and control risk assessment is inversely related. What does inverse mean? Opposite. It's inversely related to detection risk. So if this is high, this will be low. If this was low, this will be high. So it's inversely related. But the key way I want you to think about it, and I went through this with you all last week, and it's in the lecture recording from last week, but if, there, if there's a higher risk of material misstatement, 
we'd want to do more detailed testing. And ladies and gentlemen, by doing more detailed testing, you reduce your detection risk. Remember what detection risk was. Detection risk is the risk that your procedures will not pick up the issue. How do you reduce it? By doing more detailed work. So these two are linked. Okay. Now you might be thinking, well, why would we ever want detection risk to be low or to be high? We would want detection risk to be high if these two were low. If we're dealing with a low risk situation, then we would do less detailed testing and that would relate to detection risk being high. Now we would be okay with that. Why? Because it's a low risk situation. All right, so that's the best way for you to start thinking about it. And if you are getting stuck, please do let me know. Now on that note, this is what I didn't mention to you before. Every time that I've mentioned the word detailed procedures, ladies and gentlemen, what I've meant is substantive procedures. And we haven't discussed this at length yet. We're going to start discussing this in the next class. But please be mindful, every time I've asked you, would we do more detailed or less detailed, and you've responded, you've responded as to the extent of substantive procedures we would do. The more detailed procedures you want to do, that means you'll do more substantive procedures because that's the detailed one. And as I said, I'll go through this in more detail with you, but that just gives you an idea of why in here the references are to substantive procedures because they're the detailed ones, all right? Please use this matrix and this one, all right? Because up until now, you'll notice I keep on only referring to risks as low or high. I haven't brought the M word into it, medium. This is the matrix that starts to introduce that for you. So once you're comfortable with how things are related, feel free to use this matrix to essentially allow you to see what the detection risk would be given the different risk assessments of inherent risk and control risk. Okay, so let this be your reference point. Final thing I'm going to mention, I only have three more minutes with you, is that, uh, what was I going to say here? Oh, I've kind of already mentioned this a little bit. Yeah, pretty much all I wanted to say, just to reiterate, is the higher the risk of material misstatement, the lower the materiality threshold that we would set, so the lower the, the misstatement we're willing to tolerate, and as a result, the more testing we would do. Remember, higher the risk, more testing. Okay, if you link it back to the topic that we had today, if you're dealing with a, an environment in which there's a high risk of the information being wrong, you would collect more evidence, and guys, take it one more step, more, not only more evidence, but also more reliable, high quality evidence. So link it back, remember evidence, there's amount, so quantity, and also quality. So if you're dealing with a high risk situation, you not only want high quantity, so a more, more evidence, but you also want more reliable, more high quality evidence, all right? Uh, on the alternate, so if you flip it, the lower the risk, then you'd be happier with more basic evidence because there's a low risk situation. And again, we will be building on this in the coming weeks, but please start getting your mind around this. Remember, this is... Mm, Remember that next week, you, it's Shuvac week, so we don't have classes. So even though I love you all, I'm not going to be here. Plus, it's my birthday, so I don't want to be here. Um, but I will be here, but anyway. Uh, we don't have class, okay? So please enjoy the week off. But in saying that, please use it as a really good opportunity to kind of catch up. If you're, if you're having issues with things, please do use it as an opportunity. Go back through the lecture recordings. Go back through the slides. Reach out to me if you do have any questions, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, just as a final note, key takeaways, you need to know. Materiality, you need to know that it links to the nature and the amount and what materiality threshold is. You need to, guys, pay very close attention here. <laughs> you need to know the audit procedures in these slides. Go back and the biggest thing that I want you to work on is your ability to link them to the assertions, right? That's going to be a really, really big skill to develop. So procedures and the link to assertions will be key and we'll keep on building through this, okay? Use the discussion board as much as you like if you are having issues. Please make sure you finalize your video interviews if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week off and I'll see you next time. Take care, guys.